First one, address challenges in promoting tolerance and non-discrimination and best practices in combating modern-day anti-Semitism. And here I want to thank you very much for the United States and this Commission support, especially to Senator Cardin and also to the newly appointed U.S. Special Envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism, Mr. Alan Carr. We were happy to welcome Mr. Carr in Bratislava just a day after his appointment, along with my personal representative on combating anti-Semitism, Rabbi Andrew Baker. Our second conference just last week focused on preventing and countering terrorism, as well as violent extremism and radicalization that lead to terrorism. In preparation, we took due note of the brief briefing on counterterrorism organized by Congressman Hudson in December last year. It was very symbolic that our conference took place in the immediate aftermath of the destruction of the last Daesh stronghold. And the message from the discussion was very clear. This is not a time to get comfortable. Terrorism and violent extremism pose as grave a threat as ever, and it continues to evolve. We need to address the root causes and stay one step ahead. That's why we at the OSC need to continue updating and adapting our toolbox so the future does not catch us unprepared. The role of the Helsinki Commission in bringing new developments and trends to light is invaluable. You keep us alert to emerging challenges from human trafficking and shrinking space for critical voices from civil society to protection of national minorities. And here, I would underline our commitment to all mandated human dimensions events, namely Human Dimension Implementation Meeting and Human Dimension Seminar in Warsaw, and three supplementary Human Dimension Meetings in Vienna. The first one just took place the day before yesterday and yesterday. Slovakia places high importance on advancing the protection of the safety of journalists especially after last year's horrendous murder of investigative journalist Jan Kuciak and his fiancée Martina Kushnirova, which left Slovakia in an absolute shock. Support for the protection of journalists has been expressed through last year's Ministerial Council decision, one of two adopted in the human dimension after several years. And we are working closely with all three independent institutions of the organizations namely Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, High Commissioner on National Minorities, and Representative on Freedom of the Media. But to advance these themes, to advance our security and cooperation, we must band together. And it appears the world has started to forget the value of multilateralism, this fundamental problem-solving and war-preventing tool in international relations, the raison d'etre of the OSCE. So our third priority is to promote effective multilateralism, both within and outside the OSC. Within, because the comparative advantage brought by a representation so broad that it brings parties with entirely contradicting interests to the same room every week is immense. And outside, by promoting the OSC's strategic partnerships with other international bodies. Just last month, I was in New York to brief the United Nations Security Council and engage on strengthening ties between the OSC and the United Nations. I have done the same at the European Union Foreign Affairs Council, at NATO's North Atlantic Council, and Council of Europe's Committee of Ministers' Deputies. And promoting partnerships also means connecting with non-governmental actors, think tanks, women's groups, youth networks, and other civil society partners. Because while these organizations differ in mandate, membership on, or functions, these differences do not play to our disadvantage. To the contrary, there is a wide space for complementarity of actions to bring not only enhanced coherence and effectiveness, but also better use of resources. We must remember one thing. While our roles vary in many key aspects, the context of our activities remains the same. We are here to work for a safer and more democratic region where every person enjoys security and individual rights. In this globalized and interconnected age, 
working together on multilateral platforms is not a luxury we can afford to opt out of. It is inevitable if we want to safeguard peace and prosperity for our people. And the OSC is the platform to do just that. Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission, I truly welcome this opportunity to engage with you today. And it was very useful to meet many congressional delegates at the OSC Parliamentary Assembly gathering in Vienna on 21st February. Because the representatives chosen directly by people are the best link between the organization and those it was created to serve. You bring the local knowledge. You bring the outlook from outside the meeting halls. You know best what concerns the people you represent. In that way, you are key in making the OSC people responsive. So I'm very much looking forward to our discussion, and I thank you for the attention you have given me today. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Um, it's deeply appreciated. You were very clear, uh, concise, and to the point, uh, Your Excellency, and I uh, genuinely appreciate that. We've been joined uh, by uh, one of my <coughs> colleagues, uh, uh, Commissioner Brian um, uh, Fitzpatrick, who spent a considerable portion of his career uh, before coming to Congress in Ukraine. So he and I both have our Ukrainian experiences. Uh, I don't know whether you uh, uh, were made aware but I was the lead e election observer after the Orange Revolution I know. Uh, in Ukraine. And the follow-on to that was in Armenia when I was the lead observer. I wore an orange tie, and the New York Times reported that I was bringing the Orange Revolution to Armenia. <laughs> I mean, it, little things, can you have to pay attention <laughs> to, to what it is you do. Uh, I didn't take the advantage at the beginning because I knew others would uh, come, but I'd also like to take uh, one moment uh, uh, to recognize Slovakia's ambassador uh, to the United States, His Excellency um, Ivan uh, Korchak. Um, wave your hand <laughs> so we'll know who you are. And I don't know that my colleague came here, but he is one of my dearest friends in Congress, uh, Congressperson Peter v uh, Visklowski. Uh, who is from the uh, Slovak caucus in the House of uh, Representatives. And Peter never asked me to join that caucus, so I'm going to tell him I'm joining. <laughs> it's just that simple. Um, if I'm not all I probably am already a member, but I'll make it a point that I do become one. Uh, and uh, my colleague, Congressperson Jim Banks, I don't know whether Jim is here or not, uh, but he's from the Slovak caucus in the House of Representatives. Uh, and if you don't mind, uh, Brian, I'll start out with the questioning and then turn to you. And we're expecting that Roger might have an opportunity to stop by. He or Ben, we don't know just yet. Uh, but, Mr. Chairperson, you've had an opportunity to make a few visits to OSCE countries. And I remarked to you of uh, the chairs in office uh, that I have known, and I've known six personally and got to know them extremely well when I was president of the Parliamentary uh, uh, Assembly of OSCE. Um, I know none that have made as many visits as you have in the short time uh, that you are in office. Uh, but in making these visits uh, this year to Ukraine, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia, not to mention the uh, conflict areas that have been with us uh, quite some time, did you have an opportunity to meet with uh, civil society uh, during your visits or during this visit to the United States? <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, yes, indeed, uh, we want to be and trying to be a very active and a useful chairmanship. And therefore, we are wasting no time. We've only got one year if we want to make a difference. And therefore, I paid my first visit to Ukraine already in mid-January, which was followed immediately by my visit to Moldova. Later on, I, I visited Azerbaijan, Armenia, and before that, Georgia. These were the visits focusing on uh, the crisis area, either the hot crisis, the hot conflicts, or protracted conflicts, and I dedicated my attention to uh, engaging with policymakers. At the same time, 
engagement with civil society is very high on our agenda. Uh, civil society was present in the two high-level events that we've already convened in uh, Slovakia, the conferences I, I, I was referring to. I'm going to visit Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan next week, and, and the meetings with the civil society are part of my schedule, as it, they will be part of my schedule uh, in visiting other uh, three countries of the Central Asia and all the Western Balkans uh, regions. And I'm also uh, planning to organize a, a special meeting in Vienna with the so civil societies from the, uh, the crisis regions to, to hear their views. So uh, we, we interact, we engage, and we will do that. And we o obviously also expect the participation of civil society at the ministerial uh, meeting in December. That's very much uh, 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 appreciated. Um, we know we're having difficulties in um, uh, certain locales, and I've experienced it as you have. Uh, I've also experienced the critical uh, positive nature that the NGOs bring um, uh, to developing societies uh, within our uh, OSCE mandate and our mission uh, as we go forward. I said to you earlier that when I joined this organization, um, we, in my very first meeting, had a whole afternoon session on migration. And this was in the 90s. And so how OSCE countries address migration is becoming key to the preservation of democracy, peace, and unity in much of the OSCE region. With well-deserved and well-designed and fairly implemented migration and integration policies also having a positive effect on combating intolerance. Will efforts such as the OSCE High Commissioner on National Minorities work on so-called new minorities and advancing best practices, such as those reflected in Ljubljana guidelines on in integration of diverse societies, be continued and revisited for possible implementation? And what other plans are, are there within ODIA to address areas that impact human rights in the social and economic <coughs> integration of migrants, uh, such as protecting against employment discrimination and ensuring equal access to quality education and housing in addition to combating uh, hate crimes? And I regret uh, uh, to say this, that uh, I, I, I highlight the fact that the first meeting that I attended discussed migration. But every meeting thereafter that I attended, well on into um, uh, 2008, as I remember, uh, had equivalent discussions with reference to uh, migration. So I leave you with the question, uh, Mr. Minister. Well, you are asking <laughs> the right question, Mr. Chairman. Migration is obviously a question uh, or an issue that is very high on the agenda, not only for the OSC, but uh, for other international organizations and uh, also for national governments. And last year was uh, a very important year uh, related to migration also in my career because uh, uh, in July I was applauding as the president of the United Nations General Assembly and I had, had tears in, in my eyes when General Assembly agreed on the text of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration, the first ever multilateral document trying to address the issue of migration from the global perspective and trying to manage. And then uh, in uh, November, I submitted my resignation as the foreign minister of Slovakia when my country, my own country, pulled out of uh, signing this document. Uh, so uh, migration is, is very close to my heart. Uh, when I speak about, about uh, mul effective multilateralism, it's, it's also about uh, better complementarity and synergy with, uh, with other international organizations. So, uh, right now, we believe that lead in addressing the issues of migration belongs to the United Nations. Uh, after the meeting in Marrakesh, after the adoption of the Global Compact, there are meetings discussing the implementation of this document. And uh, at the same time, for European nations, European Union is another platform where migration is discussed very thoroughly and, and in great detail. So mm -hmm. migration is present in discussions uh, uh, within the OSC because simply it's present in our daily lives, but it's not formally 
uh, among the priorities for our chairmanship because we simply don't want to interfere with, with the work of other uh, international, international bodies and partners. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, obviously, uh, as I said, uh, wherever you go, whoever you talk to, this issue is part of, uh, of, the, of the debate because it's part of our da daily life. Right. And I'm very sorry uh, to, to say that uh, we are still struggling, we are still reacting, we are uh, still uh, somehow going through painful process to find the right answers to this global phenomenon. Right. And I think you run to where we will resolve it, if at all, and that is with multilateralism. It isn't going to come about. I mean, each country can uh, uh, do its own thing, as it were, and will. Uh, but we are better when we work together in that, in that regard. We've also been joined by the new ranking member of um, uh, our Helsinki <coughs> Commission, and that is uh, Congressman uh, Joe Wilson uh, from uh, South Carolina. And Joe, I'm going to ask one more question now and then ask Brian and then come back to you if you don't mind. Excellent. Okay, real good. Um, close to my concern in light of the fact that I'm one of the prime movers I sound like a bragging society up here sometimes, but I'm proud of the work that I've done in the OSCE over the years. Uh, but I was one of the prime movers in creating the Mediterranean partners. And just so is how when you are meeting with NATO, you can get them to understand something. We did the Mediterranean partners in the Parliamentary Assembly before they got involved in NATO, so they kind of got the idea from us, I like to think, <laughs> although they were on their way as well. Uh, at the last ministerial council in Milan, the participating states passed a declaration on security and cooperation in the Mediterranean. The declaration called for Mediterranean-related <coughs> issues to be clearly reflected throughout the relevant work of the OSCE across the three dimensions of comprehensive security, among other things. How do you plan to use your chairmanship to advance the goals of this declaration? Are there other initiatives regarding the Mediterranean partners and the region in general that you wish to pursue? And what are the main obstacles you perceive to enhancing cooperation with and among the Mediterranean partners uh, for cooperation? And Mr. Minister, um, when I was extremely uh, active, uh, I spent a considerable amount of time in this arena. As a matter of fact, I think I'm the only uh, chair of uh, the Parliamentary S Assembly that visited all six of the uh, Mediterranean partners on more than one occasion. Um, I still consider it critical uh, for us, for example, in the area of migration. How, how could we really ignore uh, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Jordan, uh, Egypt, and Israel, well, sure. and uh, then have discussions about migration, knowing full well uh, that all of them are having either similar problems or perpetuating parts of our problems, uh, that dependent upon uh, what transpires in terms of their people leaving their countries. So toward that end, I leave you with the question, and then Brian, if you would. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And as you know very well, the Troika model in uh, the OSC works quite efficiently, and uh, there is also a division of labor within the Troika. So last year, when Slovakia was still incoming chairmanship, we were already responsible for Mediterranean partnership. So we organized the meeting in Malaga, and I was presiding over that meeting in uh, end October. The meeting was dedicated to a particular issue of energy and energy cooperation, energy security. Yes, sir. But you are very much uh, right, Mr. Chairman, saying that, I mean, all three dimensions of the OSC work are very relevant, and when we speak about migration, of course, the Mediterranean partners are, are extremely important. So uh, we ha I'm, I'm very glad that we have this platform. Uh, you ask wh what I s where I see the challenges. Well, I was uh, a bit disappointed that we do did not have a political representation from our six Mediterranean partners. Mm -hmm. And obviously, we. And I, I used to be a, a bureaucrat myself, but d do you have a different level of discussion among politicians and among experts? And uh, 
this is a platform that OSC is offering to the partners. And I ask, what, what's wrong? Why, why the partners do not show up at, at the level that the, the OSC uh, participating states are showing up? So this is what we need to, to explore, and we are working on it. Malta is proposing, creating a position of the special representative for Mediterranean partnership. If uh, it will bring an added value, what we want is to use the platforms for a meaningful dialogue. We are all busy people. We have so many responsibilities. So to go to meetings with little value added is is just a waste of time. But I really believe in in an importance of this of this uh, dimension, the Mediterranean dimension of of the OSC work. So I really hope that we will be able to use use the potential of this platform. I wouldn't ask you um, uh, to do as I'm going to do, and that's to ask uh, George if he would uh, use his good offices um, as a uh, uh, parliamentary uh, uh, assembly uh, chair. Um, I spent a lot of time, and it was personal time, a lot of it calls and uh, exchanges. Yeah. And I know him extremely well, and I know you do as well. Yes. So let's, let's pressure him to see if he can pull them together for if if nothing more, uh, where are we meeting Luxembourg, mm -hmm. Luxembourg. Um, uh, in Luxembourg, and see if we can get as many of them as possible uh, there. All right. Thank you, Brian. We'll do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, pleasure to be with you on the uh, commission here, sir. Congratulations. Uh, thank you for uh, for being here. And um, you come from a very beautiful country. Uh, spent a little bit of time in Bratislava. Um, uh, as an FBI agent, and it's a great city and a beautiful country. Congratulations on all the progress your country has made as well. Um, I want to touch on two issues, one specific to Ukraine, another more general. Um, the annexation of Crimea, the ongoing invasion uh, in eastern Ukraine in the Donbass region. Um, there, I'm the, the co-chair of the Ukrainian caucus here in Congress. Uh, there's been some concern uh, regarding military training, uh, lack of support, um, uh, in Donbass and the precedent that we're setting um, by allowing an annexation to occur in clear violation of international law uh, with impunity. Uh, what role do you think this commission should play in uh, yourself? And second, on the broader, broader issue of corruption, um, the majority of my time I spent in Ukraine was um, standing up the, uh, they call it the NABU, the National Anti-Corruption Bureau. Uh, it was um, designed to fight uh, high-level corruption um, at higher levels of the government, um, which is clearly a problem in Ukraine and many, uh, many parts of that region uh, and parts of the world as well. Um, and so many of the challenges when we look at uh, economic instability, political instability, human rights violations, they're symptomatic of what we consider the root cause issues, one of which is corruption. It's a huge problem uh, in many regions of the world. Um, what would you like to see our commission do in partnership with you uh, to help that? Because I'm something I'm very, very passionate about. Ukraine is, uh, of course, the top of our list of priorities as the chairmanship of the OSC uh, for obvious reasons, because uh, we have a hot conflict. People are suffering. People are dying on a daily basis, and we, we need to do something about it. At the same time, Ukraine is our neighbor for Slovakia, so we have been very active in assisting Ukraine uh, ever since, since the, the beginning. And uh, let me remind you that by uh, building uh, the gas interconnection, uh, Slovakia allowed for a reverse flow of, of gas from Europe to Ukraine and thus guaranteeing the, the energy uh, independence, or energy security for Ukraine. And this has really changed the picture because Ukraine could no longer be blackmailed uh, through, through the gas negotiations. Uh, my first visit took me to Ukraine on 15th of January. I went to uh, Kiev. I, I, I met with the Prime Minister, Minister of Foreign Affairs, but also Minister of Defense, and I asked them, what can we do together? What can we achieve together? This is a particular year. You have presidential elections, you have uh, 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 parliamentary elections, but this is not an excuse to do nothing, because as I said, the people are suffering. And uh, so I said, let us try to identify what, what we can do to them. Uh, next day, I and I ha have to say that we I, I'll come to it. We, we had a very good discussion uh, with with our partners. Next day, I went to the only crossing point in the Luhansk area, the the bridge, uh, Stanitsa Luhanska, mm -hmm. and it's uh, really 
a very sobering experience when you see more than 10,000 people crossing this bridge daily, waiting in lines to get uh, all the permissions, and then walking for two kilometers. Most of these people with, with the difficulties to walk. And the bridge is uh, damaged and needs to be repaired. And there is the famous lack of political will to agree on parameters. <coughs> Even though the, the, the project is there, the budget is there. So we put the, the repairing of the Stanislav Luanska Bridge on top of a list of things we, we want to accomplish. I, I, I refer to this list. There are nine concrete measures. This is the one, number one, and I am also, also using my meeting with the US partners to ask for the US support. There are issues like protecting civilian infrastructure, humanitarian mine action, exchange of detainees, for example, addressing ec environmental challenges. And, and this is what we want to do so that people see that we care because they don't have this feeling. They are very disappointed, they are, they are very frustrated, they think nobody really cares about it. Uh, the issue of uh, annexation of Crimea is the issue that we have been addressing very clearly, and I beg to not agree fully with you that Russia got away with impunity because there was immediate reaction from the international community. Sanctions were introduced uh, at, at the level of European Union, and the, the sanctions are, are still in force. NATO changed its strategic posture, has reinforced the eastern flank uh, as, as a consequence of this. And there are many other measures. Uh, we've recently well, uh, issued a number of uh, statements, say, reminding ourselves of the fifth anniversary since, uh, since this illegal annexation. I spoke about it in my opening uh, speech to, uh, to the OSC uh, Permanent Council in, in January. And we made it very clear that this issue will not disappear. So, uh, but what we need to do is to demonstrate to the Ukrainian people that the international community is with them, so that they don't feel abandoned. And uh, the issue of corruption is, uh, unfortunately, it's a plague uh, that is present in the society. And what is very important is that we speak about it and we demand action. And uh, your commission has a very high credibility speaking about these issues. So I would like to encourage you to, to raise these issues. But let's, let's see, make it very clear that uh, the corruption cannot be addressed by adopting laws, but only by the implementing the laws. So there is a big distance between adoption and introduction into real life and implementation. So let's judge our partners and friends not by the number of laws they have adopted, but by the effectiveness with which they are implementing these laws and, and with the impact these laws are having on the functioning of the society. And this will help them and this will help all of us in the future. Thank you. Before then, the usual, I'd like to introduce uh, Senator uh, uh, Cory Gardner, who has uh, joined us, and then Joe, and then Cory. Uh, I asked, was that a vote that you were called? It's a quorum call. A quorum call, so you all have an hour to get the quorum call. <coughs> That's right. <laughs> Go ahead, Joe. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for welcoming me to the Commission uh, at the Capitol Building. I look forward to working together with you. And it's particularly uh, significant, uh, Chairperson, to be here with you, um, with the Republic of Slovakia. Uh, I had the opportunity, uh, it, one of the first things I heard when I got here was the importance of NGOs. Well, I know it personally. In 1995, I uh, participated in lecturing uh, in uh, Slovakia. I, I found out the extraordinary history of Bratislava, what a beautiful country Slovakia is, the heart of Europe. And I um, then had the opportunity to work with the uh, Ambassador Peter Burian uh, very closely, and uh, he came to my home state to observe a presidential primary. Mm -hmm. And as the voters were leaving, we were shaking hands, and I was introducing the Slovak ambassador, and we found out uh, that a high percentage had Slovak heritage. So uh, that we have a, a shared heritage that we greatly appreciate, and I, I wish you well on your service. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, over the years, you've been very active in Balkan affairs, including as a high representative in Bosnia and as a moderator or mediator during the Montenegrin independence referendum. Now that you chair the OSCE, what challenges do you see still in the region, and what role can the OSCE play in meeting the challenges? We're glad to see the progress in relations between Greece and North Macedonia, but do you have any optimism concerning developments in Bosnia or in relations between Serbia and Kosovo? 
Thank you. Thank you, sir. And you might know that Peter Burian is now the European Union Special Representative for Central Asia. Here, here. And he's doing a great job there. Here. Yes, uh, and we are very proud of him. Best wishes to him. I'll see him very soon, yes. Uh, Western Balkans is a region that has made a significant progress since the end of the tragic Yugoslav war, and we do not face, uh, I would say, security challenges, challenges to peace. But there are many other challenges. Uh, the process of transformation of, the, of, yeah. of their societies, and I would say Europeanization of their societies, is uneven. And of course, we have success stories, uh, countries like, like uh, Croatia that is already a member uh, of the European Union and NATO, or, or we have Albania and, and Montenegro who are members of NATO. And then we have uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina that is struggling. Of course, Kosovo is struggling with its uh, identity. So we need to keep our eye and pay our attention to the region. We need to stay engaged. Uh, I'm absolutely convinced that the best future for the region is European future. That means the mem mem future membership in the European Union. And they have this promise. What is really important is that this goal is seen as uh, credible, realistic, and tangible. Uh, that there is no feeling of European Union moving the goalpost. Because if we want European reforms, and they are very painful, they need to see the, the end game, which is the membership. And the European Union, I'm personally a very strong believer uh, in the European project, and I've dedicated my professional life to bring my country into the European Union. The fact is that since uh, uh, several years, the European Union has been busy with internal issues, uh, migration crisis before, the financial crisis, now the Brexit crisis, and uh, we sort of lost uh, focus from the region of the Western Balkans. And, uh, and, and this resulted, I would say, in the less uh, 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 enthusiastic approach to reforms. So uh, w what I experienced myself is that the region is moving in the right direction every time when the European Union and the US are working hand in hand, realizing and understanding that it should be the European Union who is the face, because it's the European Union that is offering the, the perspective. So we need to keep the European perspective alive and, as I said, credible and tangible. What I see is uh, there are no unsolvable problems. The name issue for North Macedonia seemed un unsolvable for 20 plus years, and yet it was done. And it took two leaders with vision, with courage, and, and, and they delivered. So what I see as the most pertinent issues right now is the lack of progress in the dialogue between Belgrade and Pristina. And I really believe that we should focus more on it and, and demand both partners to solve their uh, open issues through this dialogue. And then the functionality, or rather the lack of functionality of Bosnia and Herzegovina. The good thing is, as I said, is that these are not the problems that could result in conflicts. No, I mean, the, the region is past that stage. But people are losing faith. They are losing confidence in the future uh, of their countries. Young generation is leaving the, these countries in huge numbers. And this is very bad. So therefore, we need to bring this, uh, this, this trust uh, back into these countries. We need to engage more with them. Thank you very much. And uh, the OSCE plays an important role in negotiations to end conflicts, including the 2008 invasion of Georgia by Russian forces. Uh, what, what is the status of OSCE actions in Georgia? Uh, and again, a uh, newly democratic country, a very dynamic country. Uh, I've had the opportunity to visit at Gori, and you can actually see uh, the fences that the uh, Russian Federation had placed um, uh, as part of their occupation. And what is your role uh, to try to mediate? I visited Georgia uh, as part of my introductory visits, and uh, of course I've been uh, in Georgia many times before, but this was the first time in my capacity. I also went to, to visit the line of contact as, uh, uh, to the, the south of Ethiopia, uh, and you see how much this really divides, I mean, villages, and how much it interferes with people's lives. And at that time the, the crossing points were closed, so I used my coming visit to Moscow to urge the Russian side to use their influence to have these uh, uh, points reopened. The good thing is that the, the Georgian situation could be defined as protracted conflict or frozen conflict because people are not dying, not on a daily basis. So uh, at the same time, it's been more than 10 years, and uh, we would wish to see, uh, of course, a greater progress. We have two mechanisms. 
Geneva in, 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 in International uh, Dialogue and the IPRM, which is uh, the Incidents Prevention and re Resolving me Mechanisms. So we need to invest into these two, mechan uh, into the, these two mechanisms to keep them alive and to address the issues through, through these formats. So this is very important. And we need to be patient. I s obviously met the, uh, my interlocutors partners in uh, the Georgian, Georgian government, and I appreciated the constructive approach uh, that the government has taken, adopting a strategic document, the steps into the future, which is trying to engage with citizens uh, and being very generous with citizens of these two occupied territories, uh, allowing for medical services and, and other services. And I think it's really very important that you keep the dialogue and, and, and keep the, uh, the contact uh, at, the, at the people's level while making sure that we are trying to, to, to address the, the political issues at the political level. Very important. Thank you so much. And my final question, in many ways, the OSCE has been a pioneer in cybersecurity issues. In 2013, participating states agreed to the first ever set of cybersecurity confidence building measures. How does the chairmanship view the continued contributions of these confidence building measures in a climate in which the state directed cyber attacks appear to be increasing in frequency and severity? Cybersecurity is an issue that is uh, influencing our daily lives, and uh, we are paying attention to the cybersecurity within the OSC as well. And I uh, refer to a number of high-level conferences in my introductory remarks. We have already organized two, and the one in June will be dedicated to this issue of cybersecurity. And I uh, am already trying to mm, present this conference as a as a very special event because. If the security in the 20, 20th century was about protecting borders, about hard security, security in the 21st century is very much defined by the cyberspace. And we need to understand this new narrative of security. And we want to use this conference in June in Bratislava to offer this new uh, perspective on security. Because if we want to be able to counter the, the challenges that are coming from the cyberspace, we need to be able to define and to understand them. So I really hope, and I've already invited uh, also the participants from the United States to come and share the experience and knowledge about the cyberspace and cybersecurity. Thank you very much, and I look forward to working with the chairman in the future. All right, Senator, before you begin, let me introduce um, Commissioner Gwendolyn Moore, uh, who has uh, just joined us. Uh, she's from Wisconsin. All Please. right, Senator. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for your uh, time here today before the commission. Uh, this morning, uh, Secretary General, uh, Stoltenberg talked about uh, uh, the conflict in Ukraine and uh, illegal annexation, invasion uh, by Russia uh, being the first action uh, forcefully taking of a country since uh, World War II. Uh, looking back at uh, the actions in Ukraine 2014, Georgia 2008, uh, but particularly Ukraine, what should the U.S. or OSCE done differently uh, in response? Uh, your comment uh, of we must make the people of Ukraine feel that we are with them, I think is what you said. What should we have done differently uh, in 2014 and after in Ukraine, U.S. and, in your opinion, OSCE? I don't think we have uh, made any mistakes uh, on the side of our organizations, but uh, probably we did not react properly to 2008 and Georgia. And. Uh, this was, uh, well, there were some measures taken, but uh, we were not really, we as the international community, not only the OSCE, but also NATO and the European Union, not really consistent with our reaction. And uh, uh, probably, well, uh, if we had this chance to go back in time, probably that reaction should have been different back then to prevent future actions uh, like this. Uh, the second point is that uh, and I feel very strong about it that we really need to use the multilateral system that was created after the World War II for a real dialogue, if needed, critical dialogue. We need to use these platforms uh, to, to, to speak up and to, to raise the right questions and to demand answers. Because somehow, more and more, we are meeting in these formal meeting rooms uh, to exchange monologues rather than to engage in, in, in real dialogue. And the dialogue is happening on the sidelines some, somehow in different formats. But I 
uh, you know, before 2014, there were, and you know very well, Mr. Chairman, there were questions about the, the need for OSC to continue existing, and there were different agendas, uh, Corfu process and others, uh, Helsinki plus 40. And then uh, the Ukrainian crisis came, and all of a sudden everyone realized that there is no organization better suited to deal with it than the OSC, because you have the, the political level, the permanent council, and you have the presence on the ground. And OSC has the primary mandate in dealing with the Ukrainian issue. We have 1,500 plus monitors in the special monitoring mission, and every other orga organization, UN, NATO, European Union, is relying on, on the facts found and delivered by, by the OSC organization. So, therefore, we really need to use the potential of international organizations. And every time we see signals, because these things do not happen out of the blue, but again, way too often, and I'm now speaking not as a chairperson, but as a professional diplomat of 30 years, that we way too often tend to ignore the, the signals that something is going wrong and uh, bad things are about to happen. And we only start acting after they have happened. So the prevention is extremely, extremely important. And I really believe that we can do a better job here in preventing all this. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and, and excuse my tardiness. Um, lots of things happening, but I really wanted to be here. Um, so, Mr. Chairman and, and members of the Helsinki Commission and, and uh, His Excellency, uh, Mr. Chairperson of the OSCE, it's nice to see you again. I met you briefly uh, in Germany, and I'm happy to be here today. And I tell you that um, you, you leaned into one of my concerns, that this is probably a really, really critical time in the OSCE organization and your chairmanship uh, at this time. Uh, and uh, I'm thinking, uh, because one of, one, of our, one of our partners, the, Fed, the Russian Federation, certainly has violated all of the Helsinki uh, principles um, as we uh, have so carefully constructed them, these violations um, are things that we need to address. And, and I am concerned about the reputational risk to the OSCE unless we have a plan of action to deal with the Russian Federation. Also, like uh, unless you've already done it, to sort of describe what your impressions were when you visited Ukraine in January. Uh, I thought that that was a great act of political courage on your part to really lean into the, one of the primary sorts of um, issues that we have and just want to get your feedback as to what you think uh, the OSCE can do more um, to uh, resolve the violations of the Russian Federation and what you think the internal um, status is of, uh, of the Ukraines. Ukrainians, thank you. Thank you, Madam Commissioner. And uh, obviously, as a chairperson in office of the OSC, I'm not in a position to uh, judge the participate, participating states since I'm speaking on behalf of the organization. But what I want to say is that uh, OSC is unique in many aspects. And one of the aspects is that one of the, that OSC is one of the few international bodies where United States and Russian Federation are sitting in the same room at the same table. There is no, uh, there are not that many ad others, probably only the, the United Nations, uh, which of course has 193 members. So uh, therefore, we, we have to use th this fact to, to, to look eye to eye and to, to talk about issues and to use, use this potential as, and, and this unique platform. This is what makes the, the OSC unique. And uh, therefore, as I just spoke about, I really believe that uh, there is a lot of potential of the OSC uh, that has not been used yet. And I am a strong believer in a dialogue. And I, I am absolutely certain that the critical dialogue is better than no dialogue at all. And uh, talking to each other is better than talking about each other. And OSC, <laughs> please feel free. <laughs> uh, so, and OSC gives us this platform. So we will have to use it uh, to address the, these issues because it covers this the, the huge territory from Vancouver to Vladivostok. There is so much uh, things we can do, uh, and, and, and we have to. It's uh, way too often 
the, the work of the organization and OSC is, is not the only one is blocked because of uh, but some issues not really related to the core business of the of the organizations. Uh, we still don't have the agreed budget for the, for for this year uh, because of unrelated issue. But it's already uh, April and it, this is really limiting our activity. So this is one of the uh, examples how we need to use the potential of the organization. The second part of your question about Ukraine, uh, for us, uh, the, the focus on people is is very much uh, our priority, and uh, we uh, want to show that th there is a political level of processes. There are different mechanisms, but there are people, and uh, these people need to see that there is someone who cares about them, and. Uh, being a politician myself, I know what the lack of political will means. That means you don't want to agree. You don't want to reach a deal. But when I was standing uh, on, uh, on that bridge, which is, as I said, the only crossing point in the Luhansk area, people have to travel more than 100 kilometers to get there, to wait in line, to cross these two, two kilometers. Try to tell them that there is no political will. Uh, I, and and I, I wonder what the reaction would be. And these people are so... they. They are beyond frustration. They are not even frustrated. They, they like, have given up. They don't trust anyone. So, therefore, we are trying to identify the issues, how to help them. In, if we widen the D-mine zone around uh, schools, uh, uh, the kindergartens, hospitals, nobody is losing. Everybody is winning, for example. If we try to introduce uh, the bus line so that the people will be able to travel also by bus or by train and not necessarily on foot, no one is, is, is losing, everyone is, is winning. So this is what we are trying to do. Not losing uh, you know, focus from the big picture, but understanding that there are real people and real, real uh, destinies and real lives be beyond that. And if we will be able to help to, to ease the suffering of some of these people during our year, I will be very happy. His Excellency, I just wanted to commend you on your uh, focus on youth. I think uh, just when you talked about prevention, um, that is just the um, quintessential strategy for preventing chaos um, is to, to deal with the youth. Is, are there any particular initiatives that you can share with us um, that we ought to amplify uh, through OSCE? Uh, I'm thinking uh, when we go back uh, for our July meeting, we might be prepared to, to come up with some resolutions that address uh, some of your priorities in that area? We want to make sure that youth is part of everything we do because uh, uh, we don't want to like o organize one event dedicated to youth and then continue the business as usual. So we are uh, reaching out to young people and, and we want to hear their opinion, particularly in the third the human dimension of, of our activities. So we want to make sure that they feel that OSC is, is also their organization and they have their say. In, in everything the OSC is doing. Thank you. I yield back to you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would like to piggyback on Ms. Moore's comment in that regard and to emphasize the fact that in cybersecurity, young people know a hell of a lot more <laughs> about uh, uh, we will uh, what's know. going on than we do. And if you don't think that's true, ask your eight-year-old, uh, just let he or she pick up your cell phone and see what they do with it yes, that you don't know, know how to do. I know. Uh, and that's true of all of us in each of the dimensions. So the earlier that we turn to some particular program that allows for youth to have some advantages uh, uh, that we as adults don't share at that moment, uh, the better off we'll be, particularly in the area of cybersecurity, and I mean that most sincerely. You don't need to be introduced to a friend Senator Roger Wicker is here, and you know him extremely well. Well, thank you very much, and, uh, and I appreciate my two House colleagues who are usually under the five-minute rule for uh, uh, filibustering long enough to uh, keep this hearing going, so <laughs> I, I could get down here. I'm sorry I'm late. I'm sorry I, I've uh, missed a, a good bit of it, but uh, Mr. Minister, we are uh, thrilled to see you, and um, my goodness, it's great to be back with my 
friend of longstanding and a colleague, Elsie Hastings, and to see you looking so good, Elsie. Yeah, I'm holding on. I'm tight. Oh, I tell you, it's just wonderful. It's wonderful. And um, we've um, worked um, on a bipartisan basis, bicameral basis, um, to make the strong statement that the Helsinki Commission is relevant to so much that's going on these days that uh, our participation in the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly is um, absolutely pertinent to so many issues. My colleagues and I were um, at a joint meeting of Congress earlier today with the Secretary General of NATO, uh, where there's uh, quite a bit of overlap. And, uh, and I think so. I think we're making a statement and continues this afternoon. Mr. Chairman and uh, Ms. Moore, um, in in this hearing today from the chair in office, um, and we're delighted at Slovakia's chairmanship um, this year, and uh, thrilled to uh, to have our friend uh, Miroslav Lychek uh, uh, with us. Um, for more than forty years, the OSC has worked to bolster security, democracy, and the rule of law and respect for human rights. Um, uh, certainly, uh, I, I don't know if Senator Cardin has been able to, to uh, touch base today, it. but um, uh, he and I, along with uh, other members of the Helsinki Commission, um, introduced um, a resolution in 2017 to recognize the importance of the Helsinki Final Act and the OSC as well as their relevance to American national security. And I can tell you, Mr. Chairman, uh, when you ask the generals who have jurisdiction in Europe uh, what they think of OSCE, they say it's a valuable uh, tool, um, not only to, have to get the parliaments together, but also um, to provide information sometimes that we're not able to get um, from any other source in Europe. Um, we're a 57-member organization that operates, has to operate uh, by consensus, and certainly we've had our challenges. Unfortunately, as the Secretary General of, of NATO pointed out today, Russia has tried uh, in many ways to abuse its power and, and OSCE to block consensus and, and use the power of the purse to paralyze our mission. Uh, we hope that improves. I'd like to see the day when uh, when um, there, there is not this conflict within our parliamentary assembly with uh, uh, our Russian membership. But Russia has attempted to redefine European borders. Let's just face it, it's a fact. Through force, so countering the Russian Federation's clear, gross, uncorrected violations of all 10 OSCE core principles should be among the highest priorities for any OSCE um, chairmanship. Mr. Chairman, we appreciate the fact that you visited Ukraine in January. I uh, understand there um, has been uh, some uh, Q&A in, in that regard. Uh, I'm also um, heartened that someone with a deep understanding of the Balkans uh, is engaged at this critical time. Uh, I had the opportunity to lead um, in July a nine-member bicameral bipartisan delegation to Bosnia, I believe Ms. Moore was with us on, on that occasion. We, our trip included uh, trips, of course, to the Federation part, but also to Republika Srpska. And it was an eye opener, I can tell you. Um, I remain deeply concerned about the region as a whole. Um, and perhaps we can hear um, you elaborate on your views as how we might strengthen the process of democratic reform, fight against corruption, and, uh, and fight against uh, regional instability. We stopped um, a, a bloody conflagration there over a decade, over two decades ago, but um, I'm afraid we're frozen right now, and I'm, I'm deeply concerned and heartbroken that the people of the Balkans are not um, well served. Um, some, some decades after um, NATO and the United States and others came in and, and um, 
helped stabilize the situation. Finally, uh, we're honored to have you here um, today, uh, Mr. Minister, on the occasion of the 70th anniversary of the founding of NATO and 15 years after Slovakia joined this essential transatlantic alliance. It was great to see Secretary Pompeo visit Slovakia in February, as he said when he stood before Slovakia's Gate of Freedom Memorial, remembering the more than 400 innocents who lost their lives attempting to flee communism. Um, we stand in unity with the people of Slovakia in Europe in recommitting to a future that is more prosperous, secure, and most of all, free. So um, just to echo the, the uh, kind words of support that I know have already uh, been expressed today, I wish you every success. Thank you much for, uh, for being here. And, uh, and if, if there's anything you'd like to add uh, based on my comments, I would certainly be glad to hear them, I don't, although I don't wish to, to prolong um, the event for those who've been here for quite some time. Actually, I was going to ask the minister if he had a minute more for one or two more questions. Yes, of course, I'm at your disposal. I'm Please respond. not coming here that often, so uh, of course I... Did I say anything that uh, requires a, a, a response or a elaboration, Mr. Minister? Not an elaboration, but uh, I would like to re react to a couple of statements you made. Sir. First, I uh, have no doubts about the relevance of this Hel Hel Helsinki Commission. I mean, it's a, it's, the relevance is huge. It has had a, I mean, a very strong impact on the trans transition process in my own country. There are many politicians in my country who are scared when they hear about, about the Helsinki Commission, <laughs> and rightly so. Uh, and you have been very strict in insisting on the basic principles of, of Helsinki document and, and the respect for the ru rule of law and human rights and non-discrimination. So uh, my wish for you is to continue doing what you have been doing so, so, so successfully because uh, you have been instrumental in uh, bringing about the changes in our part of the world. And uh, OSC, as I said, it's a very unique organization because, and I've seen it again during my years in the Balkans, it's seen as a partner thanks to the presence on the ground living side by side with people, sharing their daily concerns, assisting them with practical issues, access to water, electricity, basic services. So people trust the OSC. And it's really about the organization, about the OSC, how we can uh, turn this trust and the knowledge from, from the ground into political action. And here, of course, we w could wish for a better, better result because s somehow we are not always processing the information in the best interest of people we are uh, we are supposed to serve here. So uh, uh, this, is the, this is the challenge for all of us. And uh, for the Western Balkans, I've already elaborated, and I don't want to, to repeat myself because there was a question before. I am more optimistic. I, I really believe that the, the, the region is irreversibly on a positive trajectory. Uh, the process has slowed down lately because the attention from European capitals and, and from Brussels has uh, been weakened, and this is an interaction of two partners. So very briefly, what I want to see is uh, European standards. I mean, insisting on the countries bringing, introducing European standards in every aspect of their lives and the functioning of their societies. It will not come if they don't believe in European perspective, and this is something the European Union should guarantee for them. And second, to give young people trust in the future, in their future lives in their countries. So they don't have to think about leaving their countries and, and looking for opportunities somewhere else. And, and this, is a, this is an issue that is, is very much present in the region. But it, they are both doable. And, uh, and there is also an understanding in, in the international organization that this needs to be done. I will visit the region now in my capacity of, of the chairperson in office, all the countries, because OSC is present in each and every one of them to try to address uh, the issues on the ground, but talking to people, including the young generation and civil society actors. In Slovakia, civil society is very active, very dynamic, very influential, and this has been instrumental in, uh, in a successful transformation of our country. So we know uh, what civil society mean, and therefore we are very much 
in favor of working with civil society in other countries and encouraging civil societies to play their role because they are, uh, I would say, the critical voice, the watchdogs, but they are making sure that the politicians know that they, they are under, under public scrutiny. And that's extremely important for every sound uh, democratic society. Ms. Moore, you had something you wish to add? Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your indulgence. I just wanted to commemorate the second anniversary of the death of someone who uh, originates and emanates from my district in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and that's Joseph Stone. Joseph Stone is a medic, a uh, contractor uh, for the OSCE. Uh, who was killed in April of 2000, uh, 2017. Um, just wanted to mention, for the record, that uh, while OSCE is, is not a peacekeeping force, it's not an army, um, that many of our members uh, in their efforts, their humanitarian mis uh, missions, uh, put their lives in danger uh, for the, the common good and for our purposes. And I just wanted to remember Joseph Stone. And Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for your indulgence. Yeah, and please let the record reflect that uh, we mentioned this. Um, it shall, without question. And uh, the SMM mission um, uh, speaks for itself, and hopefully we can enlarge it. Uh, it's particularly critical um, uh, that we have on the ground forces, and Mr. Stone is um, uh, uh, thanked his family uh, uh, for his bravery and his contribution with his life uh, to better the concerns uh, for all of us. Mr. Minister, we didn't get to tolerance and discrimination. We didn't get to Central Asia. We didn't get to counterterrorism. Uh, we didn't get to beneficial ownership registries, which <laughs> my country is uh, dealing with at this point. And certainly, we didn't spend as much time as we would like on economic and environmental um, uh, uh, dimension. But the fact of the matter is uh, that we covered a lot of ground. And you were very clear, and I deeply uh, appreciate it. One thing I would say to um, uh, my colleagues, and I say it to them often, is that if we travel more, meaning members of the Helsinki Commission, uh, it helps even if we are uh, with limited time on the ground. And uh, Senator Wicker um, has seen fit uh, that we do that as often as we can as a collaborative uh, under CODELS. Uh, but I encourage, even when it is not uh, our CODEL, if it's a Helsinki Commission on somebody else's CODEL, and they raise uh, uh, the uh, issues uh, that are pertinent to the OSCE, that it always is helpful. And I'll leave you with this uh, and how important it is that you visit. Um, Karimov, before his death, uh, I consider myself to have become a friend of his. Mm. And uh, the reason for that is, uh, again, a little more bragging. I'm the only individual that I know in the United States Congress that spent a week in Uzbekistan. Oh. Uh, but in addition to having spent a week there, I visited there five different times. So I went there with a group whose name will be not mentioned, and he treated us royally. He really did. And as we were about to leave, one of them asked, you've been so nice to us. Uh, what could we do to help you? He said, you could do like Mr. Hastings. You could come here more. Okay? So I think if more of us in the American Congress were to travel about the world more rather than what I've seen in the last decade, us tending to listen to our media who tells us that if we travel, we are not doing the business of our colleagues. And I wanted to share with you the plight that we all have of um, young people leaving um, uh, for greener pastures. Uh, Senator Wicker and Ms. Moore and myself uh, and Joe Wilson, uh, not so much Cory Gardner, who was here earlier. I don't think he has the kind of rural areas uh, that 
uh, Senator Wicker and uh, Ms. Moore and I and, and Wilson have. And believe it or not, we are having that exact same issue in our respective jurisdictions um, and constituencies where they're seeking greener pastures. Somewhere along the line, we have to, through multilateralism, find green enough pastures for all of these children to land in safe spaces. Thank you so very much, Mr. Minister. This hearing is adjourned. Thank you very much.